No, we, we, we would like the microphone, actually, because uh, we, we need the microphone. So after five days and nights on the Gold Coast, I have the brain of a wombat <laughs> and the voice of a sea lion. But you may have noticed, noticed that my voice is strikingly similar to the voice of Professor Summers. I wonder why. So the topic is direct perception. It is a key notion in the theory of perception advanced by James Gibson. And it is an elusive notion. In many respects, it is a terribly simple idea. It is the claim that the proper objects of perception are exactly the same as those of activity. It's an unbelievably simple claim. It's a claim that there are only two terms involved in this theory. But we have typically proceeded along this line. An indirect perception itself is a terribly simple idea. It says, if you wish, that there is a third term, a tertium quid, an in-between thing that must be brought to bear to make theory viable. So here, you'll notice, the two diagrams are slightly different. The animal walks on the surface, but the animal sees M that represents the surface. The question, I think, is why we should proceed with the three-term story. It is epistemologically paradoxical. We know this. We've known this for centuries. But we are unable, scientifically, to give ourselves the two-term relation. The two-term relation is scientifically elusive. And today I'd like to introduce you to why I think this may well be so. There's some fancy words here in the course of the next 30 minutes or so, I hope to make them reasonably clear. I only hope, I'm not sure I will attain it. When a scientist tries to lay hold of the concept of perception, that scientist does so in the context of the ideas provided by the founding fathers of the mechanical philosophy. They are, from top to bottom, Galileo, Descartes, Newton, John Locke, and Boyle. But we may find it useful to ask what might be the case when the contemporary 21st scientist tries to lay hold of the notion of perception armed with the ideas that are our legacy from the 20th century. The ideas of Einstein and Niels Bohr, of Poincaré, and to his left, John Bell, of Belasov, and just below him, Poincaré, and then slightly across, Mr. Harkin, uh, Prigogine, sorry, I did that last time. Yeah. Prigogine, Mr. Harkin, and Mr. Rosen. We will consider, I think, first of all, what are the premises that we were provided with from 17th century science? And then with a little bit of luck and with some slow progression, we'll try to see what the 21st century might look like in regard to this issue. The ghost in machine model and Descartes' trialism, I think it is fair to say that there is no greater influence on how we think about problems of perception and action than René Descartes. His trialism and his ghost in the machine are with us to this day, and they have guided almost all of our thinking on this problem for 300 plus years. Here's the ghost in the machine, picturesquely. The ghost is in an inner room. Contact with the world is by means of a TV screen and speakers. Descartes, in his genius, this is what he told us, the first grade of sense is approachable strictly through mechanics, strictly through physical laws, as he remarked. What we have to ask, and think of the beauty of the way he phrased it, what we have to ask is how the motions of light become the motions of nerves. That's a problem of mechanics, or hydraulics, depending on which particular metaphor you chose. The second grade of sense he recognized was a hybrid. But nonetheless, science could approach it, he suggested. The question here is how do the motions of nerves become secondary mental qualities? Color, in the case of vision, for example. Pitch, in the case of hearing, for example. To these first and second grades of sense, the pure physical and the hybrid mental physical, he suggested what is perhaps one of the most important metaphors, suggestions, 
expositions ever in the history of science. He said, I should like you to consider that these functions follow from the mere arrangement of the machines or organs every bit as naturally as the movements of a clock follow from the arrangement of its counterweights and wheels. This is the machine metaphor. And it's hard to imagine that our science of today could have got anywhere without it. But it is a metaphor of a, of a long history. And I would like us to consider the possibility, which I'm not alone in asking you to do, that this metaphor is now in the way of advance, not part of the means of advance. Here are the assumptions that the founding fathers of the mechanistic philosophy gave us. The locality assumption. All causes are local. All causes are by contact. So in order to sort of address perception, if there is some object to be seen, then what I need is a simulacrum of that object. In modern terminology, we might say, a representation. But there are many terms we could use for this. But this must occur according to the notion of local causality. It must occur because given two things, A and B, A must make physical contact with B, must be contiguous with B, if it is to cause a change in B. This is the locality assumption, tremendously powerful and terribly important. The matter assumption. Matter, the 17th century founding fathers of the mechanistic philosophy told us, is passive, inert, has no self-motion, no self-cause. They had to argue this. They had to. They had no option here. If the thing moves itself, they then contended, then one part of the thing must be the mover, and another part of the thing must be that which is moved. This is how you solve the absence of self-cause and self-motion. In terms of the ghost in the machine, it looks like this. The ghost is the unmoved mover. And that apparatus, on its little wheels, or a ghost in machine is living in some sort of mobile home, <laughs> right? the ghost inside the thing, this is the moon. <coughs> Look at it here. This is modern neuroscience. Frontal lobes house the unmoved movement. And then parts are moved, brain and body. This is how we are forced to handle this problem. We have to have some device which acts as the unmoved mover. The matter assumption. There are entailments. And these entailment assumptions, again, tremendously influential. Without them, one could not imagine that we could have progressed to where we are today. There's the genius of Newton. Single entailment mode. Present entails the immediate future. And this is how he couched it. He encoded environment into force, and he encoded into formalism, and, it, sorry, and he encoded system into a formalism, in which the only entailment, Newton's genius, is a recursion rule that takes speed and position, position being x subscript 0, speed x prime subscript zero, and it makes it into the next immediate position and next immediate speed. In order for us to pull off this interval, it required that we develop a particular mathematical apparatus that would permit us to have access, to have access in a way that we could manipulate and play with this interval, the calculus and its paraphernalia. Along with this Essential entailment is the following. Only efficient cause is properly caused. So the 17th century fathers of the mechanical philosophy, you see, were seeking to, as it were, release themselves, make themselves liberated from the constraints as they saw it of Aristotle. These are Aristotle's causes. And it's only the hammering and the chipping at the material, giving shape to the statue that's permitted under the Newtonian formula. It was a brilliant move. But we may have need for concern to worry about how in modern science, Aristotle's other causes are allowed back in inside a proper formula. Causal chains flow from parts to whole, argued the founding fathers. Subsystems to system and never vice versa. The green arrow 
is acceptable. The white arrow is not acceptable. And this is the claim for no reflexivity. And this issue of no reflexivity is part and parcel of the problem of self-motion and self-cause. They belong to this problem of reflexivity. The component assumption. Components are absolute and context independent. Functions are entailed by components. In my diagram, C is component, F is function. Components entail functions. From Descartes onwards, we have been beloved of the grandfather clock. It is a magnificent paradigm of the machine metaphor. Look what it does to us. It can be fractionated. When I fractionate it, the parts exist independently of the whole that they constitute. They still entail the same functions. Pick them up, put them into place. Take a clock, fractionate. Take an automobile, fraction it. Then synthesize, put the parts together again. In this metaphor, fractionation or analysis and the notion of synthesis are purely reciprocal. You take a part, reverse the process, you put back together. This is the underpinning to a very powerful assumption, the paradigm of of principle superposition. The paradigm of the principle of superposition is what this is. And of course, this is reductionism. This is the genius of the machine metaphor. And sitting in there is a very powerful claim, one that is terribly problematic for most of psychology, physiology, biology, zoology, and that is context independent parts. So here's the 17th century mechanistic hypothesis. I claim. And I think it's not unreasonable. The local continuous cause and the added assumption of inert matter prescribe the ghost. That is, they demand the ghost. They invite the ghost. They encourage the ghost. They want to get away without the ghost. Entailment is recursion. No, for, no reflexivity. And the request for context independence of parts. These prescribe machines. And together, something interesting, I think, follows. The psychology can be called contact psychology. It's a psychology whereby we try to understand all processes in terms of contact. In cognitive science, it is required that I find a local, contiguous cause for whatever it is I'm currently doing. A local, contiguous cause. It is a brilliant theme but it contains within, within it, I think, certain problems, one of which is James Gibson has in got a hope. You cannot get an intuition about direct perception from this frame of reference. You cannot do it. You cannot do it comfortably. You cannot do it sensibly. Indirect perception is what falls out of this story. So let's consider a potential 21st century non-mechanistic hypothesis. I say potential because I don't think there's any way we can know what will transpire here. The 21st century is new, and we have inherited a wild zoo of brilliant notions from the 20th century. They have played almost no role in how we think about matters psychological and matters biological. Jimmy Gibson used to say that one of the odd things about psychologists is they have no respect for their problems. I think he was right. They think their problem is such that you can teach undergraduates simple courses and hope they will unlock the deepest problem in the universe. The concept required for psychology must be damn hard. It must be immensely complicated. And no undergraduate curriculum even comes barely close to giving students any idea of what's going to be involved, I think. Non-locality and active matter. I would like to claim that these notions, beginning to show up and gain force in the 20th century, proscribe ghosts. And I would like to think that multiple entailment modes, the acceptance of reflexivity and the fact of context-dependent components, I think these prescribe machine. And in this discourse, by the way, as I've given this sort of talk around the United States of late, I say that the real challenge here is the machine challenge. 
I think we're sort of happy with the idea of getting rid of the ghost. The idea of getting rid of the machine is a whole different story. What does this yield? It yields what we might call non-contact psychology. And I think in here sits direct perception. To put it another way, if Gibson's hypothesis of direct perception is going to have any hope, I think it only has a hope in this framework. Here's one of his problems. Excuse me. Easy to do. Here's one of his problems, the so-called scanning problem. In this room, as I stand here right now, look, I am about to scan this room. And I have a perception of the room. I'm about to scan this structure here, and I have a perception of the structure. This is how we handle it in psychology. The sequence of samples is identified by the tau value, the time value. So there's a sample of time one, sample of time two, time two, time three, time four, etc. And I collect them together into a short-term memory. I sum these samples. And I therefore have, in short-term memory, a composite of earlier and later samples as they coexist in this structure. The purpose of this line of reasoning is so I can satisfy the requirement of local, contiguous cause. What gives me the perception of this room? I have pulled together the samples, I've used some integrator, and the moment in my head is the image of the room, which is the cause of my perception. The Gibson was a weird bugger. He was a weird bugger. He said things like this. He said, I don't think you need to assume that perception requires a simultaneous composite in the brain. If the sequence contains the scene, it doesn't have to be converted into one. Those are so radical, those sentences. Look at what the greatest commentator on 20th century and 19th century psychology remarked. This is Boring, Edwin Boring. No one surpasses Boring in his grasp of the development of our science. Perhaps Gibson could ultimately win our ascent to a temporal vacuum between cause and its effect, but it would require revolutionary thinking. So he put his money on it, put his finger on it. He put his money on it, put his finger on it, that's for sure. He put his finger on it. He said that what Gibson's asking for is a non-contact psychology. That's right. This is 1967, Gibson's book is 1966. In 1964, a very different part of science the locality assumption was being challenged. There are some causes that are not local. There are some causes that are not by contact. And in many respects, this follows from the genius work of John Bell, the Northern Irishman. It's a good representation of Northern Irish in this room. Of Northern Irish scholar. Here's Bell's inequality. Let N be number. And let A, B, and C be the parameters of some objects in a class. So imagine, there are 40 of them, there are 2,000 of them, there are a million of them. But you can classify them according to A, B, and C. So Bell's inequality reads, in its beautiful simplicity, the number of things that have parameter A and not B, plus the number of things that have parameter B and not C, is greater than or equal to the number of things that have parameter A and not C. There's nothing fancy about this. Name any, make up any three parameters in this room. Male, uh, taller than 172 centimeters, blue eyes. Make that up, do it in this room, Bell's inequality is satisfied. It has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, although that's its target. It has nothing to do with quantum mechanics at all. It's a remarkably simple expression that captures, embodies everything we believe about science. Property things exist independent of or prior to observation. Inductive inference is valid. And the principle of local, causal, local causality holds. In the latter part of the 20th century, we used a mixture of various notions and devices. These are spins up and down of electrons. The things in the middle, the stern girl like devices, are kinds of registers of particular spin values. In the case of uh, a upward arrow, that means we have a magnetic field running upward. And spin up means it's parallel to the magnetic field. Spin down is anti-parallel. 
And Mr. Bell suggested that we, we pack these things together and put them in the context of a suggested Gedanken experiment by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, EPR. And if you do that, then you can reformulate in a testable way Bell's inequality. This is what it looks like in the form appropriate for experimentation using those three diagrams that sit above it. And then you apply quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics has its rules, and it says, let's apply this rule to this little story of Mr. Bell, and what happens when you do that? When you do that, quantum mechanics comes out with the following answer. The sum on the left is not greater or equal to the sum on the right. Bell's inequality is not satisfied. So this is what he created before. He created this inequality so he could build experimental tests. Bell's inequality is not satisfied. Since 1980, this is a repeated finding. You can separate these entities. You see these two devices here? They can be separated by orders of 10 to 20 kilometers. Bell's inequality does not hold. What's the problem here? What's wrong? Is it the realism assumption? Is it the logic assumption? Something has to be wrong. Or is it the locality assumption? This is contentious. Look at the options science has. Something's wrong with those three assumptions. Which one is wrong? Basically, science has come down, not without its debate, <coughs> not completely without tendentious positions being taken. It's come down on saying it's the locality assumption. It's exactly what Einstein had feared is what's at issue. Now, this is not to say that whatever this non-locality is, is the non-locality that Gibson is after, but it's simply notions and intuitions. It's ideas that 20th century now allows us to play with, as we struggle with this deep problem of perception. Here are some entailment assumptions handed down to us towards the end of the 20th century. There are insufficient modes of entailment, says the theoretical physicist biologist Robert Rosen. Here's the so-called modeling relation. It had been introduced in the 1800s by Hertz and refined fairly dramatically in the 20th century by Rosen and slightly before him others. So what does it say here? It says over to the left is the natural system with its causal structure. And then what we attempt to do as scientists, we try to encode that causal structure into a formal system. We then run our inferences, our inductive inference process, over this formal structure, and we then decode back to make predictions about the world. Well, the formal system was given to us through the recursion rule of Newton. And the kind of causal structure we can capture is a causal structure which is sort of imagistically the causal structure of contacts. But the balls remain somewhere in our imagination, a very powerful way of thinking about nature. One thing contacts another, which contacts another. Processes proceed in this particular manner. The claim of people like Rosen and others is that this entailment structure is insufficient. Insufficient for complex systems. And there's a problem facing modern science, and it's this problem. A poverty of entailment. And I think this is, personally, as a psychologist, struggling with these issues uh, towards the you know, latter part of my career, struggling with these issues, I was taught from the time I entered the study of perception that the real problem was the poverty of the stimulus. And Gibson always said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is not the poverty of stimulation. That's not the problem. He could put his finger on what the real problem is, but maybe as we enter now, the 21st century, we can begin to see that perhaps the real problem is the poverty of entailment. We don't have enough entailment structure to pick up complex systems. We don't have enough entailment structure to absorb what is meant by the notion of perception. The problem, as Rosen and others have pointed out, is that complex systems have irre irremovable impredictivities. That's not easy to say. They have irremovable impredictivities. This word, impredictivity, this word was given to science by Henri Poincaré, certainly one of the primary movers of nonlinear dynamics. Great French mathematician, physicist, 
for the latter part of the 1800s, early part of the 1900s. He gave it to Bertrand Russell. Because Russell was trying to get clear on what should be true and proper of formalisms, what should be true and proper of mathematical systems. And Poincaré wished to help out. This diagram is not brilliant, but it's not unreasonable. I want you to consider the big white arrows. Explanation in this direction, from context to system, from system to subsystems, from function to components, explanation in this direction is what is meant by impredicativity. This direction of definition, understanding, explanation, entailment, is impredicative. And it is, as you can see, a particular process where what is defined participates in its own definition. My God. And no wonder Bertrand Russell was doing his damnedest to get rid of such things. But you cannot get rid of them. That was the lesson of Goethe. This, this is the real positive lesson. This is the true take-home message of Goethe. <coughs> Goethe's take-home message is that trying to do everything predicatively is exactly what Russell wanted, what Hilbert wanted, or the great revolution of the mathematicians in the early part of the 20th century leading to the likes of Gödel himself and to Turing. What they wanted was to get everything expressed predicatively, get everything expressed in a manner, of course, which is how we write our computer programs. Everything is written predicatively. Gödel's incompleteness theorem proves that this direction is insufficient. This is what he did, you see. You, Hilbert's suggestion was you just keep taking in predicatives and make them, re rewrite them as predicative sentences. Keep doing it. But what he showed you, you can't keep doing it. There's always a huge residue. There are irremovable in predicativities. The number system, which is a complex system, cannot be captured predicatively. People like Rosen and others would like to suggest pred predication without impredication, syntax without semantics, is too feeble a definition. Let's look at the component assumption. And in some respects, the component assumption is nicely, I think, captured through the uncertainty principle. There's nothing special about this principle. It's very generic. The principle is straightforward. It is an expression of the fact that the nature of the thing is defined by the system composed of the thing and of the measure made upon it. It's worth repeating. The uncertainty principle is generic. It is an expression of the fact that the nature of the thing is defined by the system composed of the thing and the measure exacted from it. The thing is defined in predicatively, in predicatively. It is defined in terms of the whole of which it is a part. Change the whole of which the thing is a part and the thing changes. Here's a classic example. Take an indefinite thing and put it into the context of a position meter and put it into the context of a velocity meter. This is how we sort of tried to give expression to this in the early part of the, of the 1900s. This is a mouthful, but it's worth examining. The property thing defined impredicatively by P is not the same property thing defined impredicatively by V. P is a position system, V is a velocity system. <coughs> the P measure that yields a definite thing, oh, there's an entity at this position, has no bearing on the V measure that yields a different definite thing, and vice versa. These are the horrors of quantum mechanics. Better, this is the beauty of quantum mechanics. This is the logic structure of significance, I think, to many of the puzzles, the challenges, the <coughs> affordances. Gibson's, perhaps, it's hard to say which is his deepest idea, though. Too many of them are too scary here. But affordances is definitely scary. It's a very scary notion. We're very good here. We're very good with this property. This is a primary predicate property. This is height. We're very good here. So we take a ruler, and we take an object, and we juxtapose, and we get height. But this is a different sort of property. This is a relational impredicative property. This surface is a jump onable surface for this now. And when you look at this particular problem, notice it, it is expressed by a relation with another object, just like a primary property. 
but it is actualized in relation with another, another object, unlike the primary property. This is affordance. This is why affordance is so damn hard for us to grasp. That is why Gibson is always in trouble. He's always in trouble. Because we're armed with the notion of primary properties and its legacy and its logic. So it's this kind of property we're armed. Where does this lead us? Are there two different and complementary physical conceptions of a macroscopic object? A puzzle that has raged throughout the 20th century. Do they sustain two different and complementary conceptions of causality? An issue sustained through the 20th century. But there's something new. Is the generalized complementarity principle advanced by Niels Bohr and certainly championed by Howard Patty in the United States? theoretical physicist who's worked on the origin of life property. Is this a generalized notion such that we should treat it as a matter of ontology? Not as Niels Bohr thought, as a matter of epistemology. The matter assumption. Active self-motion, self-cause. Here's Belisov Sabatinsky reaction. Take a liquid which abides by these equations. Put it in a beaker, it will oscillate between the color red and the color blue. Look at it from above in a petri dish, and it will show the waxing and wanings of colors and patterns. When Belisov first reported this, people would not publish it. They said it's impossible. It's an impossibility. 1940 sometime, I think, when Belisov was trying to publish. 1940. Could not get it in any journal in the world. Impossible. We now all accept. Not only is it possible, it's probably dominant. It's an autocatalytic process. You notice that that piece of the equation which has x in it is such that when it combines with y, you produce more of this. And therefore, you keep producing more of what you have. This process gathers in energy and matter, and it trims its properties. It is a very interesting structure, autocatalysis. It's more like formal causality than it is efficient causality. It's unlike things that we have previously worried about a great deal. And the implied form of self cause is an impredicative loop. I think arguments such as those of Harkin and others suffer because what people have great difficulty with is precisely this circular causal process. It's an impredicative loop. That's what makes it so hard for us to come to terms with. Interacting parts produce the belisov sabatinsky spiral. They produce this emergent distributed whole, which then constrains the interacting part. Matter assumption two, the one I used the other day. I like this one a lot. This is turbulence. The irony of turbulence. When, when, no, not the other one. Not the when Heisenberg was on his deathbed, he was asked by his buddies, which question will you ask of God when you get to heaven? He said, I have one question for God. What is turbulence? And the reason he saw this as difficult is, look, see, that's lamellar flow. It looks very neat and very tidy. And then this is turbulence as you speed up the flow of water. Why is this the way it is? Because in a nonlinear process, every part connects to every other part. And those parts make more parts. That's why turbulence is ironic. Turbulence arises from the fact that all the parts are speaking to each other. There's implicit correlation rampant throughout the system. That's the irony of turbulence. That's why it's been so strange to us. A subsequent physicist on his deathbed was asked, what will you request of God when you get to heaven? He said, well, I won't embarrass him with that turbulence thing. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. I'm trying to suggest that direct perception lives, perhaps, at least if we're going to try to understand how to lay hold of it, it lives, perhaps, in notions like these, non-locality, self-motion, in predictivity. It is not addressable through the ideas of the 17th century. It may be, only may be, capturable by the ideas of the 21st century. I finished thusly. What are the expectations for a perceptual theory? A perceptual theory will be abstract and not visualizable. You're not, not going to be able to draw a nice little box diagram in order to give expression to perception. It's not that kind of thing. It's not like that. It's exactly as 
the, in the early part of the century, we began to realize, once, once we were able to get rid of the ether notion, that took a long time, we realized that no more, no more did we need machine analogs. Don't try to visualize these problems. Laws and principles, not mechanisms and machines. This was brought up, I think, in talks during the week. It's not simulatable. To be simulatable, it has to be predicative. It has to be reducible to predic predicative statements. And Gerber's theorem says that's not going to occur in complex systems. By lines of argument developing in the latter part of the 20th century say complexity is defined by irremovable predicative. Not artificially bounded. It's constituted by fundamentally <coughs> context-dependent parts. Therefore, no explanation by construction. That also came up during the week. No explanation by construction. You can't build a thing and say, oh, now I've explained it. You're not going to build it. No explanation by construction. There are parts of context dependent. No fixed set of states. So we've always assumed that nature is to be understood through a fixed state space of some kind. But as we probe ever more the nature of complex systems and the like, then we have an eruption, no fixed set of states. The variables are up for grabs, ones that matter. And we've seen a lot of that this week. And finally, no explicit material processes. Said these are abstractions of the enfolded dynamics. There's some weird stuff here. Only if, however, we think that our problems are problems to be addressed through the ideas that were given to us by Galileo, Descartes, Newton, John Locke, and I've forgotten his first name, Boyle. Thank you. tools to allow us to lay hold of a particular entailment structure and it's done great work for us. Now's the time to return to this enterprise. What kind of mathematics might do that? He says, first pass, category theory. Category theory might, if we press it hard, push it hard, it's a branch of mathematics that might allow for the development of the entailment structures we need. So how do we bring them in? How do we bring back some of the things that worry Aristotle? You'll notice in uh, recent uh, articles in psychology journals, serious psychology journals, you'll see people saying, in order to understand any of our problems, we really have to have material cause, efficient cause, formal cause, and final cause. We cannot get the story told without them. And you certainly can't do it by material cause, which is where most of the arguments come from. So I think that's an interesting challenge. I'm not sure where that's going to go. Um, the last time I gave this, one time I gave this talk, and after I had finished, uh, some old gentleman came up and said, it was very interesting. You know, I wrote the first book on, on uh, what was the geometry I just mentioned? What's the kind of category theory? He said, I wrote the first book. It's always embarrassing, right? <laughs> so what's the category theory? Jolly good. I walked up, very old guy. Oh, I wrote the first book on category theory. <laughs> I hope that helps a little bit. Um, but so not so much, yeah. Uh, just on you, I agree with almost everything you said. But just, uh, just to pick up one point, the, the statement that it won't be simulable. Okay? Uh, I agree. If we're trying to make a simulation, assuming it's going to work like a grandfather clock, it won't be simulable. 
Institute for Time Making Simulation in which we're specifically relying on the emerging properties. Okay, we're trying to do it like the, I can never quite say the name, the ZB reaction. Yes, uh, subset of We're trying to do a simulation um, which is more like that than we can do simulation. Well, I, I'd say even today in computer science, I think you have good reason to be dubious. I think the frame problem, or the abduction problem as it's also called, I think poses very severe limitations. It's nice to see uh, Jerry Fodor's recent book, just to give one example. His recent book is a counterpoint to the book by Pinker, which is called This is How the Brain Works, or The Mind Works, and Jerry being Jerry says, uh, uh, the mind does not work this way. That's the title of his book. And included, <laughs> included in his argument, this is, this is a gentleman who has pressed the computational model of the mind more than anybody else, most precisely, most expertly, most seriously, all branches of philosophy and psychology. And in this book, he's facing up to the, the severity of the frame problem in all of its manifestations. And the frame problem, of course, is this simple thing that, simple thing, it's basically where uh, if one belief structure has to be changed, then, then you have to change all of the others, but not all of them. Some have to be left the same. And it's as if any new piece of knowledge must rattle through the system and bring about changes everywhere and nowhere. It's to do so selectively. And since that problem was first introduced in the 60s, 1965, the uh, group of American computer scientists, uh, it has caused many problems. And now some people are saying this, which I think is reasonable for folks like Rosen and Lyle. They're now saying, well, you know what? What this tells us is we actually don't really understand yet computation. We don't really have that notion. We might have thought it was the great achievement of the 20th century, but it's really a first step. So maybe down the road, perhaps, with a very different notion of computation at our disposal, simulation might be possible. But I think at the moment the notion of simulation still goes with the notion of cogs and wheels, but it still goes with the notion of recursion, still goes with the notion of basically successive recursion. It's a Turing machine, it's certainly not the universal Turing machine, but what you get from it, um, mm -hmm. which you haven't put in, is this incredible richness and properties like movement, which you never put into the system and so on. So that's the sort of thing I have in mind when I say an emergent simulation. Yeah, would you say, would you say though, when we do those things, uh, we're actually now simulating? Or would you say that what we've done is set up the right initial conditions? I mean, I... I'm happy to call yeah. something Because, you know, isn't there a problem with uh, in neural networks? We sort of quickly recognize that we have very li limited ideas of what goes on in those neural networks once we, once we get them up to a certain level of expertise. We could not clearly go in and identify what they're doing, identify the steps, and I think that kind of problem just gets magnified. But anyway, these are, as I said, these are only the suggestions coming out of the efforts of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, after the world sort of capture some of the text of the environment, I'm looking at bulk processes at a particular scale. Yes. How do you see this information? Well, I think. Because Arthur was a dear friend, and I spent a lot of time with Arthur. Arthur Ibrill is a physicist who uh, expressed a particular theory of complexity called homeokinetic physics. But Arthur, for him, Arthur saw complexity purely quantitatively, not in the way that I just argued, which is irremovable in predicativity defines complexity. He saw it as always capturable through the ratio of bulk to sheer viscosity. So. Uh, bulk viscosity being how much energy you can hold up and store relative to that which you're getting rid of dissipating. So his idea of complexity was the higher that ratio, the more complex the system. Not unlike the uh, notion of complexity of von Neumann, which again was as you just keep increasing the parts, you get complexity. Here, the notion is that simple systems are systems you can capture purely predictively, and complex systems are the ones you cannot capture. We need impredicative definitions, impredicative linkages. And there we go. So now the question is what would you do with this? What, what can happen in the next century in this regard? Do you think if perception and action have the same focus, so we call it? Object, you 
that sense of pain or person. Does this mean that you can never see the infinite or zero? And if that's true, what's the role of infinity and zero in your approach? You know, all of a sudden, my earliest remarks of this talk are coming, <coughs> to, coming back, which is my brain is like the brain of one. <laughs> 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 and uh, so a request to, to uh, give an appropriate characterization of infinity and zero in this context, I have to say, would not be met. <laughs> I, I use the wombat retreat. That's one more. Yeah, we don't have to talk. One thing else. Have you got any comment to make on uh, analog simulation? than digital simulation, which like, say, massively parallel analog simulation. Well, I think we, we sort of, um, typically in the, in the 20th century, we, we thought that uh, the notion of digital was an idea that we understood clean, and the notion of analog was an idea that we understood poor, it was less well articulated. And I think we also argued in the 20th century that um, whereas the digital could be made into a generalized scheme, the analog could not. It's all special purpose. Um, so analog solutions are special purpose solutions. I don't know if you know that uh, uh, the Russian inability to keep up with American com or Western computational technology was because they actually made a decision to go the analog route. Uh, this is a famous, there's a famous name for this particular decision that was made by the Soviet Union to see if they could solve the computation problems in analog fashion because they couldn't keep up with the generalized computation capabilities that came to light in the West. So what do I say? Well, maybe, maybe a deeper, better understanding of what that means, analog simulation, analog simulation, uh, may be helpful. I mean, at the moment, I still see analog step in if they need to. I still see, see analog simulations of being beautiful special purpose. Smart, smart machines, as it were. Smart solutions. Don't forget, this is still one that brain. Deteriorating <laughs> <laughs> pretty quickly. <laughs> I'm not sure it's lower than a one that. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, Why your shorts here? Okay, well, uh, the last thing for you to enjoy at this meeting is uh, we have a farewell party. It starts effectively, the clock starts ticking, in fact, uh, when you leave the ballroom. Uh, so we have half an hour of sushi and we have drinks until they run out and we have live music. And so please continue the discussion and come this way.